Welcome to the Ottawa Business Journal's live broadcast of Optimize Your Return to Office, Three Trends That Should Shape Your Plan. I'm Michael Kern from the Ottawa Business Journal. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to be here with you. And this is a hot topic. We saw that in our live registration. So we're happy to uh, pass along some expert advice on a topic that I think is on the minds of lots of business leaders. After a few false starts, I think it's safe to assume the great wait to return to the office is here to end. Uh, the question is, is your business ready? Many business owners believe the work from home only trend has translated into less innovation and less productivity, as well as a erosion of company culture. And while some degree of remote work is certainly here to say, uh, stay, these business owners still want their teams back in the office with more regularity. So how do business owners optimize the return to office plan and effectively reconnect with their employees inside an office setting? That's exactly what we're here to talk about today. In fact, we're going to present to you three different strategies that should be at the heart of your plan. The first is workplace as a destination. The second, flexibility and modularity. And the third, physical and mental wellness uh, all topics that people are talking about today. We have two experts that will be appearing live to share all of their insights to help you with your return to office plan. Let's meet our first guest right now. She's worked in Ottawa in this industry for more than 20 years and devoted a lot of her professional life to building effective workplaces. Please welcome the president and partner at Bureau Vision Ottawa. Here is Jillian Oxley Harper. There she is. Here I am. Hi, Michael. Nice to see you again. So happy to uh, be doing another webinar with you. It's exciting. Yeah, our second show together. It is. And, uh, and this one, I think, is uh, timely and we'll have uh, lots of information uh, packed into uh, a 30-minute show here. So, Jillian, just to provide a little bit of context as we're getting to go here, is, as everybody knows, we're you know past the two-year mark of being in the pandemic. And, and most of the people, uh, I think, watching today are in a work from home type environment. You've heard concerns though from business owners about what that work from home only mm -hmm. uh, plan uh, means to people. W what are the, some of the concerns that you're hearing, Jillian? Yeah, I think, I think as a general consensus, any business owner, manager, CEO is saying that we do need to return to the office. It's definitely time, it's beyond time. You know, we also understand that this hybrid model is not um, unusual. It actually makes sense. It creates flexibility for people and for the company. But we also acknowledge and need everybody to acknowledge that 100% remote work is not good for company innovation, which leads to company success. It has certainly affected the sense of communities that most companies have. They don't, those employees don't seem to have those deep connections anymore. It's certainly, um, we hear that, um, company owners are saying that the, the degree and the quality of collaboration has been impacted and that, you know, getting people back is important to not only the company, but to the people in their lives and in their job satisfaction. So if, if people are buying into our thesis, I hope they are, by the way, that you can't have only work from home uh, only, that there needs mm -hmm. to be kind of a hybrid mix. What would your quick recommendations as we're getting into uh, today's show be in terms of, you know, where they start? So what, what mm -hmm. should a business owner uh, or manager watching today be thinking about just in generally mm -hmm. at this uh, point in time? I think, you know, number one out of the gate is how hybrid will you be? And, and that's something a company can make. What we're typically seeing is three in, two at home or four in, one at home. Um, definitely a majority in the office. Um, at the same time, because, you know, for two years we've been working and juggling childcare, homeschooling, pets, you know, spouses maybe in a small condo all trying to work together. I think we, we do need to certainly exhibit sensitivity to needs of employees um, and, you know, their, their requirements when they do return to the office. And really what that means is just some flexibility and understanding of, their, of each person's circumstances. And I think employees need to, to see that, you know, instead of, you know, getting up and wandering down the hall, most companies are, are truly, truly invested in creating 
a destination, like a, a spoken hub model where, yes, we can work from anywhere, but now this workplace is really going to become a destination that's going to get us back to collaborating and to being together and to being that successful machine that we were pre-March 16th, 2020. You know, our last show, um, God, it was in October when we did the, the first one, was was talking about real examples of you know, physical changes you can make to your office, simple ones, just reconfiguring access to areas for, you know, a private call, talking about, you know, this is really where we will collaborate and socialize, create those types of spaces, be reconfigurable, be flexible. It was really about reimagining and repurposing the space that we had traditionally just gone to work. Even how we work has changed. And, you know, when you, when you start to play with those things, it can become pretty overwhelming for somebody. So what we wanted to do today was really give three key points that if you consider them, it certainly is going to make that path to creating that destination workplace where employees choose to gather, I think, a simpler task for business owners. That's uh, absolutely uh, correct, uh, Jillian. And by the way, if, if people miss that first show, you can still find it on OBJ's uh, YouTube channel. I, I highly recommend you check it out. So uh, let's get into this now. So we're going to flash our agenda items here on the screen. Uh, our first topic, as promised, is workplace as a destination. Then we're going to be talking about flexibility and modularity. And then finally, physical and mental uh, wellness in the workplace, something that's on the minds of many business owners today. We'll wrap up sometime around 1230 with questions from the audience. So if you're watching live, you can use your social media channel to post questions and I'll be looking out for those and moderating them sometime around 1230. So let's get into our first topic. And as noted before, we've got not one, but two experts here today. So we have uh, our second guest is a recognized expert in Ottawa for many years when it comes to planning uh, and design around offices. He is a principal at LWG Architectural Interiors and a registered interior designer. Please welcome Brian Weens. Here's Brian. Thanks, Michael. It's great Here's to be the here. man. Thank you for being here today. It's exciting to be included in this, so thank you guys for um, letting me participate. Yeah, this is awesome. We have uh, two for the price of one. <laughs> okay, so we're going to jump right into this topic. we got lots of people watching today. So, Brian, uh, the first topic, uh, as noted, is workplace as a destination. I'll right. hand things over to you, Brian. Thank you. Well, before I talk about workplace as destination, I, I, I want to just say, like, I'm an interior designer. And um, everything that I'm talking about or will be talking about is, is really design focused because that's, that's the business we're in. And as designers, we believe that form follows function. And our, our job is to work with each individual client to align space to your business needs, your vision, your, your mission, and, and to support your business. Um, and as we get into you know, a hybrid work environment, um, we recognize that that is a spectrum. And it's going to mean something different for each organization. So we really don't believe in a one size fits all model, but we are acknowledging and have experienced um, these three topics as trends as and not fads. Fads a fad is something different. A trend is something that we see trending. It's sticking around, and it's going to have an impact on on the built environment that we're working within with our clients. So that's kind of my little my little preamble. Um, to get into workplaces destination, um, it's a weird concept that the workplace would be a destination. It used to be our destination pre-COVID. Um, we all had a destination. Um, a lot of us weren't working from home. Now we're trying to draw people back to the office and we, we want to create a space that, that um, people are drawn to. When we start a lot of projects with clients, we will do uh, a visioning exercise and we'll, we'll ask them, what do you want the space to say about you as a company? What how do you want the space to function? All of those sorts of questions. How do you envision the space? That has changed and we've seen it change on projects that started before COVID. We've redesigned to align the space to a different vision, which is how do we create spaces that are, are, are spaces people don't have at home? Um, social spaces, uh, spaces that, that allow people to engage with each other. We've all really, really missed that. Um, we're also seeing um, different aspects of the world of design um, kind of um, intersecting in a way that we haven't seen before. Residential design, hospitality design, and 
the what we used to think of as sort of the cold impersonal office design. We're seeing those all intersecting and uh, to create um, a new type of a space that that is um, inviting and that, that draws people in. So design for delight. Um, we really didn't talk that much about design for delight, but we're really wanting the design to delight people with a focus on aesthetics, maybe key design elements and um, key pieces of furniture. And we're going to talk a little bit about furniture, but um, statement pieces, but really less formality and more focus on um, what we can provide. So that, that jumps us into the next part of the de destination, which is the whole question of choice. So if hybrid work means you have a choice working at the office versus working at home, the workplace should be providing you with choices. So we really want to make sure that there's a lot of social space, but that we're balancing that with areas for privacy, areas for interaction, and also places where people can go and do heads down work. We know that a lot of that heads down work is going to happen at home, and that's great, but it will also happen at the office. So we want to make sure that um, that, that when we reallocate space, and a lot of clients are doing this, they're not doing major renovations, they're just reallocating what they currently have, um, that the balance is right, that, we, that we, we have the right mixture of spaces. That kind of is an ecosystem, and that's the third, the third part of Workplace's destination, is thinking about the home office and the main office as an ecosystem. Um, Jillian, I think you used a spoken hub analogy we're hearing a lot about that um, and and so we're thinking about um, the home office being included in the ecosystem the ecosystem used to just be the office right with meeting rooms and open workstations and you know privacy rooms and things like that the, the staff lounge now we're thinking about a more holistic approach part of um, what's really really important here is in a hybrid work um, setup is the technology the interaction and the connectivity between different physical spaces. So we want to make sure that that's acknowledged and that's built into the design. So um, so it's really about choice, but it's also about connectivity. And, that, and, it, and it is about yeah. the nature of work. I, I like the points you're making here, Jillian. I want to bring you into the conversation yeah. a little bit to talk about workplace as a destination from a bureau vision perspective. What would what would you want to add? Well, well, this, you know, it, what Brian's talking about in these concepts and how we have to reimagine things, it really does elevate the workplace from being, you know, I'm going to my office to work today to almost a, a center of community or of culture, a community center, a destination where the teams can't help but want to gather to not only collaborate, but you know, to investigate and innovate. And the space that we give them really should be designed to inspire them to do that. And we were seeing a change to this type of model, I think pre-pandemic, but the pandemic has definitely accelerated it because we need people back in the office and creating that destination space to Brian's point with those amenities that they don't have at home, with those social spaces, with that ability to gather is really, really critical when you're planning you know, the space, the floor plate and getting people back into the office. Yeah, some, some great points there. And, and uh, go ahead, Brian, I think you wanted to add a point. No, I, I totally agree with what Jillian said. I, I, I'm nodding my head going, yeah, exactly. Good stuff. Yeah. So let's let's move on to our second uh, topic. And uh, just a reminder that we uh, are watching our social media channels for questions. So if you've got uh, uh, some questions on this topic, uh, please, uh, please prepare them and we'll be posing them to Brian and or Jillian uh, in just a few minutes. The second topic, as noted, is flexibility and modularity. So the, the first one really, to, in my mind, was about enticing people back to the office and now and thinking about the nature of, of, you know, what is the value of an office? What type of work is going to happen in that physical location? This one is being flexible. Brian, let's let's turn things back over to you. Thanks. Flexibility and modularity. These are key buzzwords for designers. We love we love flexibility and modularity, the, the ability of if it's furniture or architecture, the ability of those components to morph over time. Um, and a lot of clients that we have pre-pandemic um, may not realize it, but they already have flexible and modular spaces to a certain extent. And it's not too hard to make adjustments um, to um, suit what we're talking about. The first, the first item in terms of flexibility and modularity has to do with furniture. We love to use the term kit of parts. We used to re refer to a kit of parts when we were talking about building up an open workstation. We still use that. Um, we're really now thinking about 
the ability to um, size down a workstation. So if a client's not ready to go hybrid or they think they meet, might need some flexibility, um, maybe we size it down. Maybe it has a locker within it or a storage tower within it. Maybe later on that storage tower goes to a central locker area as we go to a more unassigned environment because, you know, we, we recognize that more people will be um, maybe working from home more than at the office. So. So that's the workstation side, but we're also looking at other furniture components and making sure that they're not tethered, that they can move around so that, um, you know, our kit of parts is beyond just the workstation. It's the meeting tables, it's, it's um, media carts, it's things that can move around the office to allow the client to have flexibility. Second one is, is modular architecture, so interior architecture. And um, here we're talking about um, demountable walls, or architectural elements like post and beam, beam systems. And Jillian could probably talk to this because Noel has um, Rockwell Unscripted, which has a whole post and beam system that, that allows you to create spaces within a space without having to pay a lot of money for a contractor to, to renovate the space. Um, our message here is that going back into the office and we should really be thinking about beta testing the office constantly. The, the office is going to need to be able to respond to the changes because we're, we're still learning. Um, and I think that that learning process about how the office needs to respond to our requirements is going to change over the next couple of years as we get used to coming back to the office and having this hybrid model. I think, and like I said before, it's going to be different for every client. So we want to think about beta testing, modularity, and making sure that um, the office can respond to those changes. And then finally, and this is an ongoing message, integrated technology, integrated power to make sure, you know, we've all been frustrated in, a, in an airport where you can't find a place to plug your phone in. We are now um, mobile workers more than ever. And as we return to the office, you know, we're going from home to the office where our, our technology is mobile. We need to have places to plug in. I think this is more about power than about data. A lot of our clients are, are going Wi-Fi, so we don't have to worry about tethering ourselves with a data cable. But um, we need that integrated into the furniture and into the architecture. We even have clients that are going back to the idea of a low-profile raised access floor to provide a modular distribution of power so they can plug in anywhere. And as the office morphs over time, they're not going to have to bring in an electrician to change outlet locations. So these are some of the key components of modularity. That's, you know, I'm going to bring you in back into the discussion here, Jillian. It's uh, if, you know, if the pandemic's taught us anything, it's to be flexible, right? So I pick up on Brian's point that, you know, there's a working thesis about what a post-pandemic office should look like, but you know what? We should test it, right, Jillian? Yeah. Well, yeah, it really becomes a moving target to some degree, you know, ease of can reconfiguration within the office should be it should just be second nature so that it can be done to suit that particular moment or that particular team size or that particular meeting requirement. And, and it's easy to do if you consider the scale and the size and the intention, for example, of the pieces that you're using. Are they on wheels? Are they light enough that uh, an, an end user or an employee can move it to where it needs to be? And then Hopefully they move it back to where it was, but it's really about that ease of movement and, and being able to take what I need and then put it back. And the other really important part that ties into the technology piece is that equality of experience in the office, whether you're remotely attending the meeting or in person. So that does speak to an investment in technology, but also the components of furniture that will support it. We never say, you know, get built in, don't prescribe technology. We say get technology <clears throat> that we can support for you. And that way, when the technology changes, you can still keep the piece that you had supporting it. So it's really about a quality of experience, good investment in power uh, sources, mobile power sources. We're getting more and more requests for that as opposed to, you know, that desktop mounted plug-in that we've all seen in the past with one outlet and one, one USB. So it's, it's thinking a little further down the road, but it's considering all those pieces as part of your flexibility and modularity strategy for the office and change it as you go along, see what works, see what doesn't, beta test. 
I like that uh, equality of experience point, Jillian, that uh, you, you've referenced before. It's because some people, we want people in with regularity into the office. Some people might not be able to do that, or this person's working from home today and these pe this group of people is there. So they need to be able to interact uh, in a bit of a seamless and equal fashion, right? So that the person on that might be on a video call because they need to be at home today uh, isn't left out of a conversation or can't contribute to a meeting. So. It's a, it's a great point. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to topic number three. I, you know, I like I like this one uh, because it really speaks to the nature of why we need to come back to an office. So the topic is physical and mental wellness. So we know uh, that some people are definitely struggling from being home all the time. We know we're getting into I, don't, I almost call them traps of of you know not talking to people and not relating to the, our our colleagues as people and under, connecting with them on a personal level. So Brian, walk us through. So, and it might not be obvious, by the way, Brian, but some people might go, really, your office can contribute to physical and mental wellness. You're going to say there are opportunities, Brian. So take it away. Well, I think we can acknowledge, and I think you kind of are pointing in this direction a little bit that um, we've all been beaten up a little bit over the last two years, either emotionally or psychologically. Um, there's been a lot to contend with and, um, we need to continue as people to be gracious to each other. And um, I think most most employers recognize that they don't wanna just force people back at the back to the office without giving them options. And those options are incredibly important. So user control is huge um, for, for your staff, for your employees. Um, and part of that, the idea of providing options is um, providing options for everyone. So continuing to support inclusion and diversity within the workplace. And we were already um, talking a lot about this before the pandemic, um, even in little ways like providing um, um, barrier-free, universal, gender-neutral washrooms, um, which provides all sorts of support for people that may not feel comfortable going to a male or a female washroom. That's just one little example. Um, we're now talking about neurodiversity, supporting neurodiversity within the workplace, people with ADHD and dys dyslexia and other, other challenges. Um, we, can, we can support that through um, sensitivity in the design process um, and hybrid work also supports that because it gives people, again, the choice, the empowerment to choose where they work. Um, I know uh, as a business owner that introverts are, they're my secret weapon they're, they're the, we, we need extroverts, but we also need introverts. They, they do so much work for us. And hybrid work is, is so great for, for introverts. Um, it gives them the, the opportunity to have that security and safety. But in terms of from a design point of view, um, we wanna make sure, and I've talked about this already, that we have that ecosystem and those spaces and those choices so that people feel comfortable, they can distance themselves if they want, they can go to a closed room and have privacy if they want. Um, so those, those aspects of choice and empowerment and support areas of refuge, things like that are incredibly important. So we wanna, we wanna acknowledge that through the design process. Um, ergonomics and comfort, really important. Ergonomics have always been important, but um, I think we wanna make sure that if we're asking people to come to the office that they have um, proper tools to work so that they're supported in, in multiple ways. Um, the, the image on the screen right now, a height adjustable station, um, we see these surfaces everywhere now. Um, we wouldn't specify a workstation without a height adjustable desk. That, that's super important. Um, the other aspect of comfort, though, is not just in terms of furniture, but in terms of thermal comfort and people's mental and physical comfort. What are you doing with your HVAC systems? Are you increasing fresh air intake? Are you um, in, you know, modifying HVAC systems to provide some HEPA filtration now that we know that, that um, you know, the virus is airborne. So how are we dealing with that? And, and are we messaging that to our staff so that they feel comfort, comfortable and secure coming back to the office? Um, also wellness, we are doing more fit well and well certified projects than we, we ever have. I'm not gonna go into the details of, of those because that's a whole topic unto itself but it's really a, a, a commitment that the employer is making to create um, a, a workspace and a work environment that, that promotes wellness. Um, and then finally, sustainability and biophilia. Um, 
we really believe in sustainable design. Biophilia is really just the idea of bringing natural materials and views to the outside and, and references to, to, to nature within the space and being sensitive to those materials, making sure that, um, that, that, that there's access to natural light for everybody, getting closed rooms off of windows, putting those on the building core and making sure we democratize the light so that everybody has access to it. Um, and those are, those are the key, three key things that I think we want to focus on when it comes to wellness, but physical and mental wellness, it's a huge topic. There's a yeah. lot to, yeah. There's a lot, lot to dig into and, and Jillian, we'll come back to you again, just to, even on the ergonomics one, right? Uh, like so many people are working from home and getting back issues and that because they don't have proper chairs, proper desk, standing desk, so on and so forth. So give us your perspective mm -hmm. from a uh, well, Eurovision it, perspective. Yeah, go I ahead. Mean, it's always been important, but especially now, you know, two reasons people are maybe, you know, coming back from sitting at that kitchen table and they're, they're now going to reintroduce themselves to an ergonomic chair and a height adjustable workstation. But a lot of companies are now looking at um, unassigned seating. So I reserve a particular workstation. I need to make sure that everything within each workstation is adjustable and is going to suit that really wide range of people, you know, from the five foot two, 95 pound um, young woman to the six foot two big guy. So I need to make sure I have that range of adjustment in my products. And that really is, is all about what Brian alluded to earlier, where we have user control and they have choice of product or where they're going to be or what amenities they're going to use. Um, Jillian, I, can I just jump in really quick? Sure. I, think, I think this is really important, but when we're, when we're talking about furniture, and I think furniture is actually more important now than it ever has been, but those adjustments have to be intuitive. Mm -hmm. So when you're working with the designer or with, with a furniture dealer, it's really important that, mm -hmm. that you, you test out this furniture yourself so that you know that it's going to be intuitive for the user to make those adjustments. Um, they shouldn't have to read a manual to adjust a chair. It should mm -hmm. be, it should be kind of, oh, that's how I do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, oh, that's, that's an excellent really point. important. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And because if it's not intuitive, they're not going to use them. They're not going to be comfortable affects their physical health, it's a, it's a vicious circle, right? But you really want to be looking at not only the ergonomics and comfort, but the, the knowledge how to use those products. And you really want to design, I think, and choose your pieces for choice and for flexibility, because those are really stress busters. If I, if I can choose to go work near a window that particular day, because I want to, in a benching application, I can do that. But if on another day I need a heads down place where I can work, that choice is going to be important to me that day. You know, Brian touched on the environmental um, aspects of well being with noise and light and air and biophilia. But what we're hearing more and more is access to outdoor spaces. And we're actually seeing floor plates where a company does have the ability to maybe create an outdoor area. They're putting in Wi-Fi. They're doing. They're putting in those portable power modules. You know, you can be creative. You can create. You know, maybe a corner office can now become kind of a wellness sunroom where I can just go in there to decompress. Maybe your building, you can create access to a rooftop with some pieces of furniture safely, of course, but where people can go out, you know, halfway through the day and just grab a, a breath of fresh air. Um, th the other kind of opposite side of it is, again, with that, that nod to mental wellness and just decompression time is we really need to create zones that are not only quiet and stress-free, but sometimes technology-free, just so that you can go and sit in a room on a couch or, and, you know, just think or, you know, jot down some notes. So there's so many moving pieces, but, you know, if you support the physical wellness with the ergonomics, with the choice, it really positively impacts the mental wellness as well and you know in terms of pandemic we heard of a lot of people that did suffer because of the isolation you know because of it being so long and you know their comfort level with getting out of that that home office which became their home their office their dining room their restaurant everything it's really making sure that people are comfortable and that these workspaces are created to not make them feel that way, not feel lonely, that there are spaces that encourage socialization and coming together within the workplace. So just as planned, hey, look at this, it's 1230 and uh, we've got a bunch of questions. So you guys are right on cue. Uh, I'm going to bring a couple of these questions on screen. So there's some good ones here. 
Okay. Uh, so the first question is from Stefan Demers, who's joining us on YouTube. Let's see if this can get up. He's saying uh, unassigned workplaces should be strongly, sorry, he's asking, should the unassigned workplaces be strongly considered when it comes to flexibility and modularity? Do you, do you two gentlemen, uh, to, sorry, do you, uh, <laughs> Jillian or, or Brian, uh, the Steph, general, Stefan's the gentleman. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll start with you, uh, uh, Jillian. Does that make sense? Uh, unassigned workplaces is the question. I think it does. I, I think it's very important because we are going to be hybrid. People have learned to work in different ways, you know, during this pandemic as well. They may not want to sit at a desk for eight hours working on their you know, their little P productivity tasks, they may be more comfortable sitting in the lunchroom, which is powered now and they're, they've got their feet up on a banquette and they're working on their laptop. So I think those, it's again, choice, give me my personal choice where I want to work, but big part and parcel of the unassigned workstations is the ability to have a good booking system, especially for rooms. And that ties into investing in your technology. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, what do you say, Brian? Yeah, I agree with what you're saying, Jillian. Um, we're seeing a variety of um, different mod, uh, different models um, from mm -hmm. different clients. So, it, like I said at the beginning, it's a bit of a spectrum. Um, certainly, if you can do most of your work from home and you're coming in two days a week, three days a week, or whatever, um, maybe you don't need an assigned desk. And and why would you why would you assign real estate um, that's not going to be used all the time. So yeah. in, in that case, we want to look at unassigned space um, from a strategic point of view and, and have our clients think through that and make that decision. I don't think there's a blanket solution here. Mm -hmm. It's not a one size fits all. As I said earlier, there are some functions that need to be at the office all the time. And, and, and those people should probably have an assigned desk. Um, I don't think that's going away. We have clients that are planning a desk for every single employee with the thought that eventually they'll they'll go to an unassigned model and repurpose space you know and we are we've planned in modularity for that for that point the federal government in ottawa they're one of our big clients um the gc workplace um design model that a lot of uh, listeners might know about um it does it does veer towards unassigned space and um, and that's what the acknowledgement that people are going to be working from home to a great degree in the future and they don't need an assigned desk um, an unassigned space works really well for them and you don't end up with a sea of workstations you end up with this ecosystem of of space closed spaces and collaborative spaces and cafe areas things like that um and getting the balance right listen we get some good questions here so uh that that was a great answer i'm going to bring this one up on screen here and it's uh, Siddharth Imagine is saying, this is really interesting. Listen, how would you create an office space that mimics the silence we've been exposed to while working from home? Concentration and productivity has gone up while working from home. And it's partly because of the, the fewer distractions around. So Jillian, let's go to you. So how do we keep the silent aspect of working from home? Assuming your home has silence, by the way. <laughs> he hasn't been to my house. Um, <laughs> um, there are ways, there are products. You know, Brian spoke about our creative wall, which has sound baffling um, um, components to it. You do have, you know, it it doesn't the this new this new cultural hub or this new workspace that we're envisioning and saying will work for people is not just a bunch of, you know, um, I'm, I'm being I'm really oversimplifying, but collaborative areas. There are heads down work areas, there are quiet areas. Um, there was, will still continue to be, you know, meeting in conference rooms with doors. I mean, there's privacy aspects and that type of thing. Um, I think that, you know, Brian, in, in terms of what you designed for the client you just alluded to, that could be of interest. But I think that there are certainly a lot of ways that we can answer to that. You can't make the entire floor plate quiet like your your house was, but you can certainly create oasis of quietness within the play within the, the space your, your comments brian yeah a couple of, a couple of ideas about this or a couple of thoughts about this one is that um i might want to turn the question on its head and say why would we want to do that when we're, we're allowing people to continue to work from home and that's your silent space or your quiet space however mm -hmm. um i think that's a cop out of an answer so let's put that aside for a minute. <laughs> um we're doing a variety of things and, and Jillian's alluded to um, creating spaces that are quiet that people 
can go to and close the door. Um, we're also creating spaces where we're zoning floors. So we do have open areas, but they're considered quiet areas, like a library setting. And, and there are protocols associated with, with that zone. And that zone is buffered from a more active zone um, where the cafe space, the social spaces are. Um, and we're, we're buffering it with hard walled areas like meeting rooms and other facilities that will create a physical barrier between the quiet zone and, and the more active um, noisy zone. So that's one way we can do that. So creating an open quiet area like a library setting um, or creating enclosed quiet spaces that people can book for a half a day, two, three hours, whatever they need to shut the door and get their heads down work done. Yeah. I also believe strongly that um, that how we design and articulate, articulate space will influence people's behavior. So a loud, vibrant um, space with a lot of pattern and a lot of color, um, it's gonna encourage um, activity. So we, we might wanna think about how we articulate those spaces to help give cues to how people should behave. Um, and, and believe it or not, it actually, um, it actually does help influence the, uh, the behavior within those spaces. Absolutely. I, we, we got another fun question here. Uh, I'll bring it back up. Here it comes from the Omira family and entire families that got together to ask us this question. <laughs> what are your thoughts? And this is like, this is more HR related, but uh, I know that you guys have a very holistic view on these things. What are your thoughts on food services, office catering, hospitality, being part of the return to office? In fact, you've used the word hospitality, Jillian, in our first show. So kick things off is is hospitality part of return to office? I think 100% it is. Bureau Vision at Bureau Vision, our culture is, is very food driven. We enjoy celebrating um, many, many things with, with wonderful arrays of food and, and just displays of food. And um, I'm, I'm assuming on the, the question with, um, th there are uh, companies that, you know, are, are doing, um, Pizza Fridays to get their employees to come into the office on Friday as, as a bit of a an enticement to join. Um, if it's more, and and this is where I'm kind of trying to see the question on a couple of angles. If is it more of a concern? You know, people are coming back to the office and they may not be comfortable with a communal buffet. You know, how would we address that? And and we um, have actually at, at Bureau Vision we. We've been open throughout most of this, and when we are entertaining clients, obviously following protocols and so forth. If there is hospitality involved, we ensure that they are individual and separate meals prepared for people, so that if there is an anxiety around this communal buffet thing, there's that. But I think that hospitality settings in their own will, I think they'll cause people to gather there. And if you can safely have um, different varieties of treats, if you will, or snacks, if you will. I think it's all part of that experience of getting people, you know, back together, you know, breaking bread together and, and talking and just enjoying each other's company over a cup of coffee and, you know, a, a muffin or something. Good. And Brian, uh, I think uh, you've referenced before in the preparations for today's show uh, that your team there, uh, you bring food in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we love to eat. Well, yeah. who doesn't, right? Yeah. But I mean, I think this is a great question because in our lives, um, the best social interactions happen around a table when we're eating. And um, if, if there's one thing that a lot of us have missed during the pandemic, it's the ability to get together with family and friends and have a meal. And in our office, I'll just use my office as an example. We, um, we eat together all the time. Um, we, we bring in lunch for our staff every second Friday, and that's something we really missed during the pandemic. We're starting to get back to that now. Not everybody's comfortable sitting around the table, so we spread out. Um, but as a design, as a design question, these um, communal eating spaces, and they're used for more than just eating, I, I want to say that, but they're becoming, um, as a, a workplace's destination feature, um, a major element, design element. Um, people are, all of our clients are looking for these spaces. And we've seen that building over the years, but now more than ever, um, people want to have the choice, the option to go to that type of a space and they'll take their laptop and work there. Um, it, it's not to say that we're replicating Starbucks within the office space, but that kind of hospitality feeling and that place where people can get together, like Jillian said, over coffee and just brainstorm, um, providing the right connectivity, et cetera. It, it's it's really a, a, an important aspect of um, of the ecosystem of a, of an office space. 
Very neat. Uh, listen, and I hate people, to give people an espresso maker. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. God's sake, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just do it. Come on. That's what's going to get them back. So yeah. I hate to say this, but we've run out of time here, uh, Jillian and Brian. So we're going to have to bid you adieu in uh, in just a second. Uh, Brian, thank you very much for being part of today's show. Thank you. Uh, you've added a lot of uh, design you. perspective. You've done a great job. And uh, Jillian, we're going to bring up your contact information here uh, in just a second. So we'll bring it on screen now. So I'm sure there are people watching that say, okay, I, I need to talk to these people. I need to get this you know, my my plan settled on. So here's how you, they can contact you. Uh, they can go to your website, obviously an email there. Jillian, you're, mm -hmm. you're obviously open to questions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, and uh, just before we wrap up, I, I want to mention that um, we've got our best offices Ottawa branding up there. And that's because we are just today, in fact, sending to press a giant 96 page Ottawa Business Journal with 40 to 50 pages devoted to best uh, offices Ottawa and Bureau Vision is sponsoring that as well. So we've got this 40 pages of photos and text about real Ottawa companies and the projects they've done. So that's really cool, Jillian. Thank you for supporting us on that. And also we're going to have a virtual launch on video of best offices Ottawa on April 7th at noon. So everyone can uh, stay tuned to that. So that's really exciting. Jillian, going to bid you as you too as we uh, as we wrap up here. Thank you for your support. As Thanks, all. Michael. Appreciate it. Take care. And a reminder uh, for everyone uh, watching: you can visit uh, obj.ca website every day for the very latest in local business in, in information. I highly recommend you subscribe to our weekday email newsletter. We call that OBJ Today. It gives you a whole rundown of the days uh, in business news and uh, all sorts of items. You can follow us, of course, on social media. Our LinkedIn channel seems to be very popular these days with about 24,000. And if you're on YouTube and you don't want to miss these videos, what you do is you hit subscribe and hit the bell icon, then you get uh, a notice every time we're live. And again, just when it comes to YouTube, reminder that all of these shows are available super easy. Uh, just search OBJ or Ottawa Business Journal on YouTube and uh, look for a full uh, lineup of videos, including uh, the first show we did with Jillian. So that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for watching. Uh, this is a big, important issue for people. Uh, keep, uh, keep on watching OBJ and certainly look to connect with Bureau Vision and all of their experts. So we'll see you soon. Stay well. Bye-bye. Uh,